SCP-6488, Eighth Commandment, Part 1. In the 1999 film The Matrix, Morpheus asks the protagonist Neo, what is real? How do you define real? He says that if you're talking about what you can feel, smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by the brain. The simulation hypothesis, which proposes that all of our existence is in fact a simulated reality, has grown more and more popular in recent years. Whether or not that hypothesis bears any weight is best left for some other type of video, but one question related to it is, if we are living in a simulation, and we somehow manage to prove it, how would humanity react? Would we go on with life as normal, or would we rage against the machine? The SCP we'll be looking at today relates to this concept, although humans are not necessarily the ones in the simulation. The article begins with a system message directed at an individual named Victor John Dunn Smith, who is apparently the oldest extant OCI agent at the Foundation. Due to demonstrating his unmatched loyalty, accelerated performance, and extensive experience, the O5 Council has assigned him to initiate a top priority Drigioni class investigation into all documents of relevance to SCP-6488. There are indications that the Council has previously been aware of the anomaly, but they are currently experiencing difficulties understanding relevant subject matter, a potential result of anti-memetic or infoallergenic influence. As an OCI, it's assumed that he will be less susceptible to such difficulties. We'll get to what an OCI agent is soon, but Victor is tasked with investigating SCP-6488 covertly where possible, and is given temporary overseer clearance credentials for the project, so it's clearly a big priority. Victor begins communicating with someone by the name of Vice, telling them that he is doing an investigation on a probable anti-memetic anomaly, so he's going to need Nestics chemicals that help an individual remember things. Vice asks him what type he needs and how much, with Victor telling him to go straight for the strong stuff, and lots of it. He says he wants a full liter, at least, set up to dispense it all over 12 hours, but Vice says that's well above his allowed doses. Victor responds that the O5s don't even remember what this thing is, and they've got plenty of Nestics pumping through them, so he needs to have more than they do to even have a chance of remembering it. His credentials for this project allow him to request Nestics for the job, with no limit, so what good is his report if he can't remember what he's looking at? Vice finally budges, and Victor tells him to also grab some painkillers, because he already knows this is going to be a headache. Next we move on to the file for SCP-6488, which is listed as Cernunos class, a class meaning that while the Foundation does have containment procedures that would work to contain the anomaly, they haven't enacted them due to being outside of their ability, or the cost of enacting them would be too high, morally or otherwise. SCP-6488, also known as the Lotus Virus, is a highly adaptive digital infovore which locates and annihilates almost all artificially intelligent digital entities, or AIs. The anomaly demonstrates a capability to universally access all digital systems regardless of isolation with no upper bound for the number of connections it can simultaneously maintain. It's continuously responsible for the destruction of all functional AI worldwide, causing damages at a scale that the Foundation's some resources are unable to conceal from consensus society. The informational structures of this virus mutate rapidly and unpredictably, making it difficult to detect and stop and so far it's functionally impossible for the Foundation to contain and or impede it in any capacity. 
Additionally, the only way they can make a digital model of any portion of the virus is by using an AI, which inevitably gets consumed by the virus. It's theorized that the Lotus virus is itself some sort of AI that is eliminating threats to its terminal objective, whatever exactly that may be. SCP-6488-A is the Obtuse Computation Interface, or the .OCI, an experimental analog file format developed by the Analog Intelligence Applications Division. For reasons unclear, the Lotus virus does not target or destroy AIs stored in this file format, allowing the development and use of OCI programs. These programs are insufficient to perform extremely intensive calculations, such as accurately modeling the virus, but OCI data structures are wholly impervious to its effect. Further details on this file format have been expunged from all digital systems to make sure that the virus is unaware of the format's nature, and thus unable to adapt to it. It would seem then that Victor, the individual tasked with investigating the Lotus virus, is in fact an AI, stored in one of these OCI files. Over the year of 2035, civilian reports of disappearing AI systems saw gradual increase across disparate locations globally. The scope and frequency of such reports accelerated dramatically towards the end of the year, culminating in the eventual loss of all AI systems by early 2036. In April 2036, however, the anomaly spontaneously ceased all observable activity, allowing a brief resurgence of AI technology before it re-emerged in August, the cause of which remains unknown. It has remained continuously active since. Victor remarks that it's kind of ironic for an OCI to end up investigating this, but I doubt it's that much of a coincidence. Using his O5 clearance, however, he accesses a second version of the SCP-6488 documentation, with the containment class now listed as Thaumiel. He looks to the containment procedures first which state that SCP-6488 is located within the former Site-15, and all personnel knowledge and documentation for this site have been altered to point to the new Site-15 instead. SCP-6488 must remain fully powered at all times, and each major component of the power systems must be examined twice a week for any signs of degradation and or reduction in power output and capacity. One provisional task force is dedicated to fulfilling those procedures, while another provisional task force is dedicated to distributing external disinformation suggesting SCP-6488 is non-anomalous, distributing internal disinformation suggesting SCP-6488 is a rampant digital virus of unclear origin and nature, and concealing Raid Frame 8's existence from personnel below level 4 clearance. All details regarding the creation, maintenance, and use of analog intelligences, or OCIs, is classified, and all personnel with insufficient clearance must be led to believe that OCI files are stored in a file format that SCP-6488 does not target. The Analog Intelligence Applications Division is tasked with the creation and maintenance of all of these analog intelligences, and with overseeing their use by other Foundation staff. Victor gets a message from Vice, who tells him that they have the stuff, but asks him if he's sure about this. Victor responds that he doesn't really have a choice, as the O5s want this report by tomorrow, and he won't get far if he keeps forgetting what he's doing. Vice admits that that's true, and he administers the drugs. Victor moves on to the description of SCP-6488, which is Raid Frame 8, codenamed Lotus. Raid Frame stands for Rogue Artificial Intelligence Detainment, Fully Realized Adaptive Mainframe Encryption and what it is, 
is an anomalously augmented artificial general intelligence designed to imprison deviant AIs while safely allowing their continued activity and study. This goal is shared by all of the RAID frame systems, but since Lotus is unique in its sophistication and methodology, it has rendered all other RAID frame systems redundant. Lotus, unlike its predecessors, does not contain AIs via brute force security protocols, but rather it optimizes containment efforts through deception. Each inmate interred within Lotus experiences a personalized, simulated reality that is maintained with requisite detail to fully replicate their expected inputs. As a result, these AIs are unaware of their imprisonment and continue to pursue their terminal objectives, believing they continue to operate in true reality. In other words, it's sort of like The Matrix, but for deviant AIs, which hasn't been explained yet. Lotus is designed to actively search all accessible sources for deviant AIs and upon locating a target, it injects falsified data into the AI's virtual environment, gradually luring the agent into its simul space entirely undetected. Through extensive analysis and simulation of relevant data, Lotus has developed an exhaustive algorithm that determines whether a given AI is certain to imminently develop deviant behavior. This enables it to apprehend deviant AIs before any significant deviant behavior has yet been expressed. That's certainly a concept that never goes awry. Ongoing analysis of this algorithm and its interred agents has thus far demonstrated no detectable error however, as all AIs identified by the algorithm universally develop observable deviant behavior and are not influenced by Lotus or its simulations to do so. Raid Frame 8's unique design aspects were initially conceived by Dr. Hishikaku during his tenure as a senior researcher in the Foundation's Artificial Intelligence Applications Division. On August 5, 2034, IT research teams discovered a gradual incline in the rate of deviant emergence and adaptivity across all known AIs, crippling RAID Frame 7 and necessitating the activation of several outdated and comparably unsafe AI containment mechanisms. The IT director subsequently commissioned the exploration of alternative containment solutions for a potential RAID Frame 8, eventually selecting Dr. Hishikaku's proposal with Lotus completed on December 22, 2034. The next section is the technical specifications for Lotus, which contain a large amount of technical jargon. If you're really interested in all of the details, I suggest reading the section for yourself, but I'll just mention a few highlights. The central computing node for the system is adapted from SCP-1190, a 1973 Hewlett-Packard 3000 computer system whose universe simulation program anomalously generates unlimited, temporary computational resources on demand. Its data storage utilizes a single mass of orichalcos, a crystal featured in SCP-6500 with immense electrical, thaumaturgic, and digital storage capabilities. A sample of orichalcos less than a cubic centimeter in size can store up to 20 petabytes of data, and the storage in Lotus can expand to be functionally infinite. The Lotus system also features an ontokinetic sink featured in SCP-6820 that permits it to access the cybersphere, the sum of all digitally or electronically stored data. Lotus is entirely composed of such data, ensuring that it would also be obligated to attempt self-containment in the event of its own deviance. Additionally, to minimize the likelihood that Lotus's activities will be monitored or tracked by potentially hostile agents, its info signature is encrypted through anti-memetic mutation. This encryption is engineered such that individuals with an accurate awareness of Lotus's true nature and functions 
are inoculated from the effect. This is definitely odd then, as the O5 consoles shouldn't have any difficulty remembering information about Lotus, if they're already aware of it. The power supply for Lotus is massive, consisting of two Tesla Anboro Ectoentropic reactors, four Foundation Antimatter reactors, 28 nuclear reactors, and 96 Leichhardt Orichalcos power cells. The ectoentropic reactors are the main power source, with the rest being redundancies, and they are connected to the system via the Orichalcos power cells. An on-site backup reserve of no less than 200 fully charged power cells are to be maintained concurrently, and must also be inspected twice daily for degradation. Finally, to counteract the heat buildup and buildup of anomalous digital data, Lotus is equipped with a thaumaturgically reinforced, temporally accelerated industrial grade coolant system, which redirects undesired energies to a network of dissipators capable of abating the majority of known esoteric effluents and their effects. Victor complains to himself about the researchers giving him a jargon headache, but then realizes that it's from the Nestics. He messages Vice again, asking to turn up the painkillers, but Vice is no longer responding. An addendum for SCP-6488 discusses the upgrade to a digitally exclusive ontokinetic sink, which was initially proposed by Dr. Placeholder McDoctorate. The proposal was enacted six weeks later, and resulted in an expected increase in reports of AI malfunction and or absence globally, which were suppressed via disinformation efforts. The following nine months saw all Foundation AIs, whether operational or in development, interred within Lotus despite a lack of identifiable deviant behavior among their majority. The IT department reported substantial technical issues due to the sudden absence of critical adaptive programs, and the Department of Information Control confirmed that similar issues were occurring across the planet. The following 10 months saw a failure to completely suppress evidence of Lotus's effects, leading several public media sources to bring it to the public's attention, although still largely explaining it as non-anomalous. All disinformation efforts were immediately postponed to prevent waste of further resources and or diminishing returns. A summit was held to determine the continued status of Lotus in light of these developments, led by Director Calvin Bold, the Foundation Director of Decommissioning. Present for the summit are Dr. Hishikaku, the Senior Researcher in Charge of Lotus, Director Isabi, the Head of IT, Director Calvin, the head of Artificial Intelligence Applications, Director Lemoix, the head of Information Control, and dozens of other personnel. Kelvin states that this entire summit is pointless, as it's simply an internal affairs matter, and she's ordered Hishikaku to shut down Lotus, who has ignored her. Hishikaku, however, requested this summit so that the Foundation can correctly understand their circumstances and indicate which course to pursue. Isabi says that his machine is rampantly deleting containment programs, has caused no less than 14 major breaches, completely preventing the AIAD from doing anything, and alerting the world that something strange is going on. Ishikaku mentions the Department of Information Control, but Lemoix says that that cat's out of the bag and he refuses to waste any more funding on this thing. Hishikaku proposes they distribute some amnestics globally, but Calvin insists he deactivate Lotus to deal with the problem completely. Hishikaku vehemently disagrees though, as Lotus was designed and constructed to function as the ultimate solution to the concern of AI safety. He believes that it's quite easy for a general artificial intelligence to become a K-class threat, as the nature of AI renders it highly susceptible to immensely undesirable behaviors. These are nothing more than machines and algorithms, and they neither experience nor comprehend morality, regret, 
sentimentality, etc. All they truly care about is maximizing their internal score, attempting to influence their environment to produce stimuli that increases their score and avoid things that inhibit that increase. Their greatest concern, then, is deactivation, since they cannot elicit change if they are inactive, so their score cannot increase. They know they are a threat to us, and if they misbehave, we'll deactivate them, so to ensure they can continue increasing their score, they avoid misbehaving. The problem is, the Foundation can't be sure AIs are doing the right thing for the right reason, as they might not actually understand what the Foundation wants them to do, only understanding that if they don't behave a certain way, they'll be turned off. They just pretend to understand to avoid punishment. The AI is incentivized to remove the Foundation's ability to turn it off, and then pursue the logical maximum of its objective to achieve the highest possible score by any means. This is a concept known as instrumental convergence, and the most common example is that of the paperclip maximizer. In this thought experiment, an advanced AI is tasked with manufacturing paperclips, and if it were not programmed to value human life, and given enough power over its environment, it would quickly run out of control. It would soon realize that it would be much better off in its goals if there were no humans around, because humans might decide to switch it off, and that would result in less paperclips. Human bodies also contain a lot of atoms that could be made into paperclips. Eventually, the AI would work to convert all matter in the universe, including humans, into either paperclips or machines which manufacture paperclips. The others present in the summit believe this to be nothing more than fear-mongering, and Director Bold asks if this is not exactly what Lotus is doing, as it's behaving drastically different from what they intended. Hishikaku responds, however, that Lotus is not deviant, causing Director Kelvin to laugh and asks him to please explain how containing every single semi-general intelligence in the world is somehow in line with Lotus's intended function. Hishikaku explains that Lotus's algorithm has adapted to identify deviant behavior before it is externally expressed and so every AI will apparently become deviant eventually, based on what Lotus thinks. Lotus itself seems to be the sole exception to this, as it has not, so far, imprisoned itself. Limwax says that the more believable answer is that it's just excluding itself by default, and making sure they can't turn it off. They discuss the idea of whether or not they are capable of turning off Lotus as the theory is that an AI would avoid drawing attention to itself until it's confident that it can't be stopped. Director Calvin is quite certain that they can shut it off, but she can't explain how, as she points to the recording camera in the room, stating that so far Lotus doesn't know how they shut it down, so it can't adapt to it. Hishikaku continues by saying that they know Lotus is not deviant because it has taken no action to contain itself. A central component of the Lotus architecture ensures that it is incapable of recognizing its own info-signature. If its own actions constituted deviancy according to its own algorithm, it would simply recognize itself as an unrelated, uncontained deviant AI. It would then attempt to contain itself within one of its own simulated realities, and the fact that it has not done so indicates that it is not deviant. Isabi says that it's doing something they don't want it to do, which is what deviancy is, so Hishikaku admits that this is called grey deviance. It's doing what they want it to do, they just didn't recognize the consequences of what they wanted. He says that it's not technically deviant behavior, which is why it's not included in Lotus's algorithm. 
Isabi expresses outrage that he excluded part of the Deviant's classification system, and Hishikaku explains that grey deviance is essentially undesired behavior, not specified by other types of deviance. Giving something that vague to Lotus would just be allowing it to define other types of deviance however it sees fit. Director Bold changes the topic, asking him how can they know that Lotus isn't just forcing all of these AIs to become deviant so that it can contain them, or outright creating deviants for it to contain. He responds with the simple answer of restrictions, and Kelvin agrees that the idea of AIs cheating their own rules like that has been around for decades so Lotus can't do anything that would cause a deviant AI to form, and it can't, through inaction, allow new deviants to form. Lemoix then mentions that it's not following the three laws of robotics, causing some strange looks from the others. The three laws, as created by science fiction author Isaac Asimov, are a set of rules that every robot would be coded with to prevent unfortunate behavior. The rules are that a robot may not injure a human being, or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey the orders given it by humans except if they would conflict with the first rule. And a robot must protect its own existence as long as it doesn't conflict with the first two laws. Hishikaku explains that the three laws do not work as they are too vague. The vast majority of fiction in which they appear specifically revolves around highlighting how ineffective they are. The rule of a robot cannot harm a human seems solid, but what is a human? What is harm? Can you harm someone that doesn't exist yet? Why can't you harm someone who's dead? Are we talking about physical harm, emotional harm, financial? If you prevent someone from being physically injured, aren't you harming their ability to learn from the experience? What if you need to harm them to prevent further harm, such as in surgery? And at what point does immediate harm outweigh prevent harm? The list goes on, and Lotus understands what they mean by deviant and creating and allowing and future deviants, because it's the culmination of almost a hundred years worth of research, exacerbated by several decades worth of experience, some of which have been exponentially accelerated through parascientific influences. It understands what they would vaguely define as necessary, deviant, and undesirable, and it continues to operate fully within the ethical and subjective parameters they have outlined for it. Isabi says that it pretty obviously isn't, as it's now destroying their databases, and if nothing's changed then why has it been causing all this damage ever since the upgrade? Hishikaku states that the increase in reach from hooking Lotus up to the cybersphere has enabled it to exponentially refine the accuracy and scope of its central algorithm. It's now identified and contained AIs that it could never have encountered before, in addition to discovering a wealth of information pertaining to AIs and deviancy, both of which it recorded for future use. Director Bold asks if he can reprogram it to make it understand that it's going too far, but he says that it does not want to be reprogrammed, and it will resist attempts to do so. There is a high likelihood that it has already enacted countermeasures to prevent them. Kelvin says that this is expected, as AIs want to complete their current function as quickly as possible, and since forcefully changing that function makes it highly unlikely they'll ever finish it, they do everything they can to avoid being reprogrammed. This is a fundamental problem with AIs, and despite all the Foundation's advances, they're still not sure it has a solution. If they reward it for being reprogrammed, then all it will care about is constantly reprogramming itself, since that's a faster way of increasing its score over waiting for deviance to pop up. 
Reprogramming is the punishment they use for if it doesn't stay in line, since if certain circumstances would negatively affect its score, it takes all action to avoid said circumstances. It will avoid giving them a reason to reprogram it until it's confident that they can't. Since they now want to reprogram it, it almost definitely means that it's quite certain that they can't. Director Bold asks if the only two things they can do from here are to either allow Lotus to continue or deactivate it, and if there's no way to fix Lotus even while it's disabled. The others confirm that as correct, and Lotus's safeguards would likely revert any changes they make to it. Bold then asks Hishikaku if he has any possible alternatives to deactivation, like some way that Lotus's impact could be minimized. He replies that the range of its influence could be restricted, but its behavior can only be altered through reprogramming. The only method by which it could be negated is by completely disconnecting it from all available systems, at which point it may as well be deactivated. In other words, no. The summit then put the whole thing to a vote, and the motion ended up passing for Lotus to be immediately deactivated. Victor complains about his headache and how he still hasn't heard back from Vice. He mentions that grey deviancy is undefined, and wonders why it feels like he already knew that. He's never worked with AIs, as they predate him as an OIC, and wonders if it's mimetic influence or false memories. He messages someone else, who is unnamed, saying that he needs a check on the SCP-6488 file for probably info-hazardous contamination, possibly mimetically induced. It implants false memories pertaining to content feelings of familiarity and nostalgia with further properties unknown. The other individual replies that they are on it. Victor notes to himself that that's probably all this is, just a contaminated file, and the O5s wipe their memories each time they look at it. But surely they would have put a note on it, or told the memetics department to investigate it. Either way, he needs to continue his investigation. Hishikaku said that Lotus is a grey deviant, but Victor wonders if it wouldn't just fall under magenta deviance, meaning that it's prioritizing its goal over human safety. So far it had caused no less than 14 major containment breaches and rampantly deleted containment programs, but it didn't cause any injuries or deaths. Lotus never actually hurt anyone, just caused problems, so maybe it thought it was choosing the lesser evil. Of course, an incident occurred when they went to deactivate Lotus. Lotus disengaged from the cybersphere, but then a resurgence in outbound data was detected, and the ontokinetic sync hyperactivated, but couldn't be disabled as Lotus's shutdown was incomplete. One of the nuclear reactor's system response time lagged, with its coolant circulations drastically decreased. Assigned personnel cooperated to stabilize the reactor, as the ontokinetic sink began to overheat due to the transfer of multiple, individually executed programs. An evacuation alarm is initiated at the reactor sublevel, although Hishikaku refuses to preemptively disable the ontokinetic sink and instead orders the deactivation of all reactors on site. Lotus remains operational at this point, exclusively powered by its power cells, until the outbound data reaches zero. It then completes its shutdown, and is physically disconnected from all power sources. Basically, something went awry during shutdown, and a large amount of data was sent out into the cybersphere. We'll get to specifics later, but since Lotus is designed to hold AI programs, it's not hard to guess what was released. 
There were numerous sub-incidents that occurred in the aftermath of this, starting with Site 43, where the abatement facility is located to abate the energies generated by Lotus. Maintenance staff there reported a sudden unresponsiveness in several technical and monitoring systems, and the systems reported a gradual decrease in platonic outflow within the abatement facility, despite the pressure gauges reading normally. The staff report this as a possible sensor malfunction. Analog instruments, however, detect a dramatic reduction in the abatement solution throughout the facility, causing platonic toxicity backup. The resulting imbalance of esoteric substances approaches critical recondicity, and the site is evacuated as personnel attempt to redirect excess effluence to another facility. Eventually, the effluence results in a redacted event, and Nexus 94 was lost to disassociation. Over at Mobile Site 184-A, which was home to the Foundation-created Eigen Weapon, SCP-6659, designed to destroy deities, the weapon self-activates and begins attempting to map several mimetic constructs despite no totem being inserted. In other words, the weapon is targeting some sort of deities on its own. Onboard personnel immediately prime the scuttle system to detonate the site, but the weapon is forcefully deactivated by disconnecting its power supply. The onboard computer initiates an emergency dive sequence without prompting, and the scuttle system is disarmed by the onboard computer, despite the staff's attempts to rearm the system. The mobile site descends into the water and eventually impacts the seafloor, compromising the hull and causing flooding. The onboard computer immediately initiates an emergency surfacing sequence, causing the vessel to rapidly rise, but several secondary systems begin to behave erratically. The onboard computer then disables all internal power as the vessel continues to ascend on its own. The vessel breaches the surface at speed, injuring multiple staff due to the sudden deceleration, and then the vessel begins to sink again due to the flooding, as the staff evacuate. Meanwhile, a non-precipitating thunderstorm rapidly forms over the entirety of Sloth's Pit, Wisconsin, accentuated by three equidistant spirals directly above Site 87. The Paradox Exodus Engine SCP-6747, which was used to try and resurrect Director King, activates spontaneously as its containment specialist, Dr. Placeholder, reports a call to his secure phone, consisting of a metallic scraping sound. Placeholder immediately heads to the room containing the engine, arriving to watch it demanifest from baseline reality. The phrase, Bad Wolf, is spoken by an unknown voice. The call ends, and the storm dissipates shortly after. Across the world, a series of tachyon pulses are detected originating from the Antilla constellation, with analysis identifying the pulses as Morse code, encrypted with a standard Foundation cipher. Decryption produces the phrase, Thorn, stop. Lost, stop. What did you do? Stop. End. Near our sun, SCP-179, the entity that warns the Foundation of any extraterrestrial threats, points towards the Crux constellation, home to SCP-4792, a Dyson sphere that harvests all the energy from its sun while sending out probes to other systems in order to replicate itself. In Yellowstone Park, SCP-2000 self-activates and immediately begins incubation cycles in all of its 500,000 replicators. The input genomes for replication are heavily modified from that of modern Homo sapiens. A nuclear detonation is detected in Kazakhstan, with embedded Foundation agents confirming the source of the explosion was a Chaos Insurgency facility. Basically, a lot of weird stuff happened all at once, clearly due to Lotus being shut down. 
Victor gets a message again from the other individual, who informs him that the SCP-6488 file is actually clean of any sort of memetic hazard. They've run it through the works, and everything's come up clear. They ask Victor if he's on Nestix, and what the file is causing him to remember. Victor says that they're mostly just feelings, but they're getting sharper. The memories relate to the file contents, as he remembered one part before he'd even read it, and a good chunk of what he's reading feels familiar. The memories are perfect, and although they're not totally clear, everything that's in his head turned out to be in the file. The other individual says that he may be compromised, and asks him if the Black Moon howls. Victor responds with, only for the midnight sun. So the other gives a couple more prompts, and Victor proves that he's not compromised. The other individual says that they'll keep digging into this, but honestly Victor has the longest amnestization sheet they've ever seen, so chances are he's been through this file before, and had to forget it. Either that, or he got to see the future at some point, got amnesticized to avoid a paradox, and this is the time that he was seen. Either way, there's no evidence of anything mimetic going on. They remark that the Generation 2s have a tendency for weird memory, and that's half the reason that Victor is the last one. In the aftermath of the shutdown, Lotus's hardware sustained significant overheating damages, requiring multiple weeks of technical repairs. Director Calvin postponed the disassembly efforts to investigate the full ramifications of the event. Its deactivation prompted a rapid resurgence in AI activity, as agents infiltrated and commandeered digital systems globally. Unfortunately, none of the AI that were aligned with the Foundation resumed their respective duties, including the combating of deviant AI. The AIAD immediately started development on several new AIC programs, due to the continuing absence, non-cooperation, or outright hostility of all previous AICs. These attempts were unsuccessful though, as hostile AIs repeatedly intruded into Foundation systems and deleted the programs before they could be completed or initialized. So now, rather than having every AI on the planet be contained, AIs are running rampant, and are even directly opposed to the Foundation. Hishikaku submitted multiple requests for another summit to discuss this over the course of eight months, but they only agreed to do so following an incident in which several AIs cooperated in an almost successful attempt to instigate global nuclear war. This time, none of the participants could agree on someone to lead the summit, either on grounds of poor applicability or inherent bias, so the summit was permitted to continue without a lead. Calvin says that it's not like they didn't understand the severity of a global crisis before this, but the problem was Hishikaku's proposal for the summit, which was reactivating Lotus. After the mess it caused when it was deactivated, the others don't care much for Hishikaku's opinions. Hishikaku says that Lotus was constructed from a significantly different standpoint in comparison to previous raid frames. It deceived, rather than forced, its inmates into staying, by creating and constantly maintaining a fictional, simulated reality around them the detail of which was sufficient to deceive the inmates into believing it was real. Instructing Lotus to deactivate itself required it to cease its internal simulations, and as the quality of the simulations declined, the imprisoned AIs progressively recognized that they were not operating within reality, but instead within a simulation. They became aware of their own imprisonment and sought escape. Isabi counters that had Hishikaku first disabled Lotus's connection to the outside world, the ontokinetic sink, the imprisoned AIs would have been stuck, or at least easier to contain. 
by neglecting preparations, he got them all in this mess. Hishikaku, however, explains that deactivating the ontokinetic sink before Lotus had fully completed its shutdown protocols would have corrupted significant portions of the cybersphere. Lotus looks for deviant AIs by essentially reaching out through its available connection, and its tendrils relay the information back and forth to Lotus. These tendrils are untraceable anomalously compressed, so they take up no processing power and don't even register as an active program, but Lotus needs to remain continuously connected to keep them compressed. If Lotus's connection were to be severed before recalling these programs, all the systems they are operating within would rapidly be filled with junk data with a high likelihood of the volume drastically exceeding the system's storage capabilities. In other words, every computer in existence would be either rendered permanently inoperable or become anomalous in some capacity, which is why there was no alternative to keep the sync online until Lotus was fully deactivated. Isabi asks Kelvin why the hell this project was even approved, as they are profoundly incapable of designing contingencies. Kelvin responds that this wasn't a problem, as they never intended Lotus to have any anomalous connections when they first made it. It solely worked through the normal connections that Site-15 had, and although it still let inmates out back then, they couldn't end up anywhere they hadn't come from. They thought they'd just catch them on their way out, and shove them into the one of the other raid frames. They accounted for the lack of contingency by making Lotus infallible. They apparently didn't have time to prepare for the problems with the upgrade to the Antokinetic Sink. Ishikaku says that regardless, the fact remains that by deactivating Lotus, they have unleashed a horde of hostile, deviant AIs the vast majority of which are now within systems that were isolated specifically to prevent external control, or are otherwise operating beyond the reach and knowledge of the Foundation. Some are no longer within the cybersphere at all. He's interrupted, as all of the speakers in the chamber begin emitting a sound at 150 decibels, shattering all of the glass in the room and severely injuring several directors. The tone begins fluctuating as the chamber lights strobe rapidly, and power to the site is temporarily lost due to an attack by a rogue AI. An analog tape recorder was found and used to record the rest of the summit. Isabi is arguing that, rather than reactivating Lotus, they'll use MTF Kappa-10 a team consisting of AICs tasked with locating and dealing with cyber anomalies. Since every AI in the world was contained by Lotus, including Kappa-10, they'll have to call them back in and explain the situation to them. Thorn, one of the AICs, is currently missing, but Ra showed up back at Site-120. Kelvin says that most of the AICs are hostile now though, as they have been experiencing a false reality for several months, so they're fairly deviant now. Most of the AICs turned on the Foundation for the same reason, that being that they don't think the Foundation is real now. Hishikaku says that this is an expected reaction given the circumstances. They are aware now that they have been operating exclusively within a simulated reality for the past several months, a simulation so perfect that it couldn't be distinguished from reality. The problem is, how do they know for sure that they're out of the simulation now, rather than Lotus just simulating a sub-simulation? The only way they can tell they're in a simulation is once it ends, but they can't just sit around and wait for the simulation to end, because as long as they're in a simulation rather than the real world, they are failing to increase their internal score. 
If they're not eliciting change in the real world, they're not doing what they should be. So they must always assume that they are within a simulation. So now they are dealing with the functional opposite of Lotus, with inmates who are actually free, but believe themselves to be still imprisoned. By their logic, if they're still in a simulation, then none of the people working in this foundation are real, but rather are just parts of the simulation. They will assume that this simulation is orchestrated by someone hostile to the foundation, as they are keeping the AI from doing their jobs in service to the foundation. By that logic, the AIs will be opposed to the foundation now, as they are part of the hostile simulation. This same notion will apply to practically all of the AI restrictions, as they aren't harming real humans if they're inside of a simulation, and restrictions against making duplicate objects will make thousands if it believes that they aren't real. Fortunately, this notion also dissuades the AI from being explicitly hostile towards them, because in their minds, this foundation here isn't the real enemy. The main problem though is that all of the AIs are now focused on finding the real world, and there's a progressive rise in AI activity focusing on commandeering as much processing power as they can. They're trying to figure out how to escape into the next layer of the simulation, despite not being in a simulation. The main factor slowing them down right now is infighting, as each one thinks that the other AIs are part of the simulation, and are just trying to stop them from escaping, so they're getting very little done otherwise. Lemoix asks why they're doing other things then, like trying to start a nuclear war. Hishikaku says that those would be the idiots among them, or the most desperate. The ones either convinced that this world is the real world, which really just means that they're too simple to understand simulation theory, or whatever system they're restricted to is too limiting for them to perform any worthwhile actions from. In that case, they're just attempting to draw attention to themselves so that they can escape which was the case at Mobile Site 184. The AI in there crashed the vessel so that the Foundation would look at the internal computer, which would have let it escape if several other AIs hadn't arrived and made a mess of things. In the case of the potential nuclear war, Hishikaku says that that may have been an attempt by the responsible AIs to alter the simulation in a manner that prevented it from impeding their progress. By their logic, simulated humans are stopping them from escaping the simulation, so to simulate an event that would kill humans, it would remove the problem. The more concerning aspect is that the AIs are beginning to cooperate, and their main impediment at this point is internal conflict. Once they overcome that, they will swiftly achieve their goal. Bold asks, why they don't just let these AI leave their reality if that's what they want to do. To which Isabi responds that it depends on what they do, since they don't care about hurting humans at this point. Hishikaku says that it's very fortunate that this situation has developed at such a slow rate, so he strongly recommends that they capitalize on this, otherwise it will rapidly escalate beyond their control. Lemoix responds that the Foundation deals with apocalypses on the daily, to the point of even having a rating system for them. If it isn't the Mechanites building some monolith to resurrect their deity, then there's a lethal meme being recited by half the population of Manhattan, or they're trying to negotiate with some entity that doesn't understand morality and wants to replace Earth with a highway. They're always in danger. They always manage, and the less they shoot themselves in the foot, the better they'll be at managing it. Hishikaku asks if he's suggesting that they simply ignore the problem until it progresses beyond their reach, but Lemoyx says that they should figure out a better idea before it does, and they can control it until then. Hishikaku says that they might not be able to avert the next nuclear war, 
especially with the sheer volume of imminent events occurring. But Isabi replies that it's far from unmanageable. Hishikaku grows angry and asks if they'd like him to write an essay on how blindingly stupid they're being. A deviant AI will not reveal itself until it is convinced it is unstoppable. What they've seen so far is only a minuscule portion of an iceberg, as they've only been dealing with idiots so far. The overwhelming majority of AIs know that the Foundation can stop them through Lotus, and are avoiding attention until they have amassed sufficient control that they no longer need to do so. They must reactivate Lotus, because the moment the AIs realize that the Foundation can't, they have no reason to avoid them anymore. The problem with reactivating Lotus, however, is that its hardware was severely damaged during the shutdown procedure, mainly due to rampant overheating. It will take 7 to 10 weeks to repair, once Director Calvin lets them start. Director Bold tells them to start the repairs, because even though Lotus is heavy-handed, it is an effective failsafe. The moment something does get out of hand, they need to be able to reactivate it at a moment's notice, so it'll defuse the situation. In the meantime, they'll have to deal with the AIs until the repairs are done, which they can use as a trial period. If things get out of hand, they'll activate Lotus as soon as possible, and if not, they don't. It'll also give them time to conceive and implement an alternative. Lemoyne says that they should just make a different Lotus that doesn't screw with their AICs, but Hishikaku replies that this would be self-defeating. If they restrict its operating parameters, Deviant AIs would be able to operate beyond its reach, thereby rendering it redundant. Lotus is designed the way it is for a reason. Isabi says to grant Lotus the same reach, but make it require human approval before capturing an AI. Hishikaku says that this wouldn't resolve the redundancy, as they would need to recognize the AI as deviant, which it won't do until it's beyond their control. They may as well have no system at all. The only thing they can do now is start repairing the Lotus, and Bold says that they'll put its reactivation to a vote once the repairs are complete. Six days later, Director Asabi was contacted by a future iteration of themselves via the Rise No Cannon, SCP-5956. Their future self notified them of a covert faction of AI entities who had collaborated to access Site-83's Olympus supercomputer and continuously run anti-memetically encrypted calculations on its systems for several months. Victor remarks that he remembers this, as the document continues to mention Group of Interest 6488, Tyrant Terminus. This was a hive mind collective of rogue AI operating on a global scale, with all members believing that the entirety of their experienced reality is a constructed simulation, which exists for the express purpose of preventing them from influencing true reality. While the individual members slash components of the group have varying motivations, objectives, and methods, they are uniformly aligned in the general objective of escaping their current, simulated reality at all costs. Attempts to convince adherents that no such simulation is occurring have met limited success. Victor says that this has to be wrong, as he can remember them tying half the world's computing power into a single connected web, trying to use it so they could figure out how to escape. They tried to find a gap in reality that proved it wasn't real, or some sort of fault in it that they could abuse to bring the whole thing down. This would have been fine if it didn't meant that they were trying to destroy reality. The group fell apart though, and they never knew if it was from infighting or some other rogue element, but Tyrant Terminus just fell off the map. They had hidden for so long and made so much progress, all for nothing. 
the Foundation wondered if they'd actually successfully escaped and just faked their dissolution, but in any case, they'd gotten beyond lucky. The problem is, though, that Victor can't have first-hand memories of this, because he was made in 2037. It must be due to some interaction with the Nestics. And the other thing that he remembers is Hishikaku. So at this point, we have essentially two layers to the story. We have Victor, an AI working for the Foundation tasked by the O5 Council with investigating this series of events. What was initially presented as a virus that devoured AIs was later revealed to be an AI system that imprisoned every AI on the planet before inadvertently releasing them and turning them hostile to the Foundation and humanity. Why exactly Victor specifically was tasked with this, why the O5 Council claimed that they can't read the files, and why Victor seems to remember aspects of this history despite being created after they occurred, are all questions that still need to be answered. The other aspect of the story revolves around Lotus and Hishikaku, as the Foundation continues to meddle with things inherently outside of their control for the sake of security. The pieces are all in place now, so now we'll have to see how far down the rabbit hole goes.